Welcome back to the Broward County Library's Armchair Traveler program, Machu Picchu. My name is Mike, and I am your guide. We saw Lima and Cusco in Episode 1. Let's head out to the Sacred Valley on our way to Machu Picchu and stop to see the Yinka ruins along the way. First stop, Sacsayhuaman, just up the mountain from Cusco. Here you can see the city in the valley below. Sacsayhuaman means Royal Eagle and was a fortress temple complex built during the reign of Pachacuti and his successors. Its massive, well-built walls remain today as a testament not only to Inca power, but also the skills of the Inca architects and their approach of blending their monumental structures harmoniously into the natural landscape. The impressive stones are so perfectly aligned, Spanish historians described a knife being unable to penetrate the seams. All this without a bit of mud or mortar. The Inca also had their blocks interlocked and the walls were sloped to maximize their resistance to earthquake damage. Time has proven their efficiency as 500 years of earthquakes have done remarkably little damage to this and other sites. Whatever towers, walls, or battlements used to sit atop the remaining walls were cannibalized by the Spanish when they took over the nearby city of Cusco and began remaking it in their image. It's likely that the huge stones of the lower walls were simply too large to move, and thus the impressive walls of Sacsayhuaman were saved. The precise function of Tambo Makai, four miles from Sacsayhuaman, is unknown, but it may have served as a ceremonial site, a spa, or a military outpost, or perhaps a mix of all three. It's built over or into a natural spring, which continuously feeds a series of small aqueducts, canals, and waterfalls built into the terraces. The site has also been called El Baño del Inca, or the Bath of the Inca. This refers to one of the long-held theories that it was a spa of sorts for the Inca ruler, and maybe for the wider Inca nobility. It's a secluded and tranquil spot, and the constantly flowing water would certainly have provided for all the Inca's spa break needs. Pizic is a village in southern Peru's Sacred Valley, 14 miles further down the road. A path winds from the square past agricultural terraces up to Pizic Archaeological Park, a hilltop citadel with ancient temples and plazas. With its elevated position, researchers believe the site served a defensive purpose protecting the southern end of the valley. It was also an important agricultural sector, and the terraces constructed on the steep hillsides are still in use today. 36 miles from Pisic, we find these ancient storehouses above the city of Olante Tambo. Pachacuti had them built to store grain produced in the surrounding terraces. They were built so high to both preserve the grain, more wind and cooler temperatures up there, and protect it from flooding or in case of attack. See the face on the cliffs. Some say it's Viracocha, an Incan and pre-Incan creator god carved into the mountains in pre-Incan times. Others say it's a monument to one of the early Inca kings. The truth is lost in antiquity. Olante Tambo itself was an Inca administrative center and the gateway to the Amazon corner of the empire. This photo was taken from the terraced farms and shows some of the town in its valley. On a side note, this is the only battle site where the Inca defeated the Spanish conquistadors before the Spanish went on to destroy the Inca culture. We've done a lot of walking, and next is Machu Picchu itself. We better find a hotel and get some rest. How about this new one, up here in the mountain? Ah, had a good rest. 
Let's get our train from here to the town of Aguas Cayente, also known as Machu Picchu Pueblo. We need to get a rail car with skylights so we can see up into the even higher mountains. We departed Olante Tambo, which had an elevation of just over 9,000 feet. And we're looking up. Good thing we have our skylights. These surrounding peaks rise up over 19,000 feet. 19,000 feet is over twice as high as we are on this train. Around every bend is another view of massive, jaggy rock mountains impossibly high. We are deep in the Andes now. This woman is walking beside the train. That's okay. There are little settlements in all the valleys here in the Andes. For us, Olante Tambo to Aguas Cayente, 19 miles as the crow flies, it's 220 miles by roads going around the mountains and through the valleys. For us, by train, an hour and a half. Aguas Cayente, often referred to as Machu Picchu, Pueblo, because it sits at the foot of Machu Picchu Mountain. It's the ideal point from which to visit Machu Picchu, and almost overnight, the scores of tourists here led to the development of hotels, restaurants, bars, shops, and everything else that a good tourist needs. Almost 2,500 tourists arrive by train every day, and this village exists solely for tourism. From Aguas Calientes to Machu Picchu, you can climb on foot. That takes about an hour and a half if you're fit. Not us. We'll take the bus. And we'll get there in 35 minutes with fresh legs. Note the line of passengers. It's a good thing we got our tickets earlier, like six months ago, for the train, the bus, and Machu Picchu, as there are only so many sold, and they do sell out. Yes, this is the road the bus takes to get to the site. Don't look down. And you better hope you have an experienced bus driver. I checked. We do. We're there, top of the mountain. This is our threshold to history. At the top of the stairs, right around the corner. But wait. Just before we see this magical place, let's go back to 1911 with this 35-year-old American, Hiram Bingham. He was not a trained archaeologist. He was a lecturer and a professor in South American history at Yale. And he was looking for a different lost city in the high mountains. Traveling on foot and by mule, Bingham and his team were traveling from Cusco through the Urubamba Valley. A local farmer told them of some ruins located at the top of a nearby mountain. The farmer called the mountain Machu Picchu, which meant Old Peak in the native Quechua language. Could there be something up there in all that mountain jungle? After a tough climb to the mountain's ridge in cold and drizzly weather, Bingham met a small group of farmers who showed him the rest of the way. Led by an 11-year-old boy, Bingham got his first glimpse of the intricate network of stone terraces marking the entrance to this city. The city was overgrown in the dense mountain jungle, for the next four years, with the support of Yale and the National Geographic Society, Bingham led returning expeditions, excavating and exploring this major find. Overgrown, crumbling. Is this what we're here to see today? What does this site look like today? Today, the ruins are being restored. Restored, restoration means to put the same stones in their original places, which archaeologists do. It's like putting a puzzle together. So what exactly was Machu Picchu? Most archaeologists today believe the city was built as an estate for the Inca emperor Pachacuti, or formerly Pachacuti Inca Yupanqui. It included a palace for the king, including a private garden and his own private bath, housing for the aristocracy who traveled with him, 
and many temples and homes and business places for caretakers and farmers, and enough farmed fields to feed everyone living or visiting here. There was even a prison. There are 200 buildings in all, and evidence more were being built when the city was abandoned. See on the left the structure on that far hill? That's the sacred place for the Itihuatana stone. It casts no shadow on the days of equinoxes. The shadows it does cast allow the Inca priests of the cult of the sun to predict important astronomical and weather events, mainly related to agricultural planning, which was the economic foundation for the empire. It was a solar clock and a solar calendar. Remember, the Inca had no written language. These terraced fields were on the edges of the city, going both up and down mountains. These are farms for corn, called maize, potatoes, quinoa, and canehua, another grain like quinoa, and edible mountain tubers, oka, mashua, and maca. These fields fed the town. By the way, interesting note, popcorn was a special treat in Machu Picchu. The stone construction of this temple, Temple of the Sun, is tight, excellent Incan craftsmanship. The unique semicircular construction is built over an enormous granite rock, and the wall has a large window. The window was positioned to capture sunlight during the winter solstice yearly on June 21st. In this sacred temple, it's believed the Incas worshipped their sun god. Inca priests would perform sacrificial ceremonies, killing animals, and reading the stomach and lungs. They could see the future and prevent any kind of disaster. The Temple of the Condor is another example of Inca stonemasonry. A natural rock formation, millions of years old, and Inca skillfully shaped the rock into the outspread wings of a condor in flight. On the floor is a rock carved in the shape of the condor's head and neck feathers, completing the figure of a three-dimensional bird. The head of the condor may have been used as a sacrificial altar. A prison complex stands directly behind the temple and is comprised of human-sized niches and an underground maze of dungeons. According to historical chronicles that documented similar Inca prison sites, an accused citizen would be shackled into the niches for up to three days to await the deliberation of his fate. He could be put to death for such sins as laziness, lust, or theft. This is a typical city street with homes to the left for caretakers, craftsmen, and farmers. Notice the stone construction is not nearly as precise as in the temples or the king's palace. Why are there no roofs on the buildings here? Because they were made of wood and brush, thatch-like, and they rotted away in the last 550 years. Alcoves built into the walls of the homes were used to store sacred or precious objects. That might include the remains of a dead relative you brought in from the burial caves, maybe to help celebrate a holiday? Llamas? There are llamas everywhere in Machu Picchu. The mountain people valued their furry friends, who they domesticated around 4000 BC and used their poop as an organic fertilizer to grow maize up at high altitudes all over Peru. Afraid of heights? Ooh, don't walk these stairways. And check out the rooms on that outcropping in the upper right. Great view. As we depart, let's take a last look. The granary is storing food for the future down on the terraced farmland. Why was this spectacular place abandoned? Machu Picchu did not survive the collapse of the Inca civilization. Between the Spanish War of Conquest and the plagues that appeared, the Inca way of life ended. In 1572, the last Inca stronghold was conquered, and the last leader, Tupac Amaru, was captured 
and executed. Machu Picchu, a royal estate once visited by great emperors, fell to ruin. Most Incan cities were destroyed by the Spanish, but because Machu Picchu was so well hidden, it remained undiscovered. It's one of the most well-preserved Incan ruins in South America. Today, many people in Peru are part of the Andean race that descends directly from Incan times. We take the bus back down the mountain, then the train back to Cuzco, retrieving our bags, getting some sleep. Our legs are really sore from the walking up and down all over Machu Picchu. Last chance to get something to remember our trip by. Colorful bags, maybe intricate silver jewelry. After lunch, we'll fly to Lima and hop our plane back to the United States. Machu Picchu, a resort for Pachacuti, he who remakes the world. I hope you have enjoyed our travel. Come on into any Broward County library and see what more information we have on the Inca kings, their conquests and cities, or even on Peru itself. My name is Mike Horning. I'm a library specialist at the West Regional Library in Plantation.